Welcome to the J. Kim Show. This is your host, J. Kim. I am an investor, author, and fitness entrepreneur. And for the first time in Asia, I sit down with the world's most brilliant minds in business, investing, and entrepreneurship. You'll learn all the secrets, strategies, and formulas to becoming a successful entrepreneur directly from the masters. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insight to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. One of the things I love about doing this podcast is I get to search and discover talented entrepreneurs and business leaders around the world. I always get excited when I'm able to find show guests locally. And today, our guest just happens to be one of them. He's been sitting right under my nose this entire time, uh, just across the border in Shenzhen. His name is Josh Steimley, and he runs a full-service digital marketing agency called MWI. Josh is a serial entrepreneur. He's written over 200 articles for big-name publications like Forbes, Mashable, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur, and Time Magazine. So Josh was based in Hong Kong for several years, just recently moved up to China. He has some great advice on how to become an influencer. Becoming an influencer is all the rage these days. I mean, who wouldn't want to be featured in a Forbes magazine or Entrepreneur magazine? But how do you get there? In our current environment of infinite noise and social media, how does one's voice get heard? So here's a hint for you. He talks about how it takes a minimum of three years. If you, so if you're looking for shortcuts, they don't really exist. Let's jump right into the show. Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate having you. Uh, for our audience, can you just give us a quick intro of uh, who you are and what do you do? Sure. Thank you, Jay. I'm happy to be here. This is exciting. I'm uh, pumped for this. And so the quick story on me is I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a speaker. I'm a writer. I have a digital marketing agency called MWI. I write for a bunch of publications like Forbes, Mashable, TechCrunch, Inc., or at least I have written for a bunch of these publications. And I've written over 200 articles over the past four years. And then I also have a book out called Chief Marketing Officers at Work that just came out late last year. I interviewed 29 CMOs from big companies like GE, Spotify, PayPal, Target, Home Depot, and as well as some startups. And the main thing I'm focusing my time on these days is my agency. And also, I love to help people become influencers. Awesome. Great intro. Uh, thanks for that, Josh. So just so the audience knows, Josh is actually based over here in Asia as well, which is a pleasant little surprise for me uh, because a lot of the guests that I have had on uh, so far have been based in overseas. So it's kind of nice to connect with someone more locally. So Josh, I, I want to go into a little bit about your background, your history. You have a uh, you have quite a, I mean, it looks like you've been quite a serial entrepreneur from the get, and there's a lot of sort of ups and downs and, and really exciting stories along your your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, maybe you could just, without going into, you know, I'm, I'm sure this is, this is, this could be a very long discussion, but uh, maybe specifically how you first got into building companies and, and being an entrepreneur and some of the sort of uh, ups and downs along the way. I know there were a couple opportunities uh, where there was some s substantial money that you left on the table uh, due to various reasons. And uh, I'd love to hear uh, those stories and exactly what led to that. Sure. Well, it really starts when I was a kid. When I was young, my dad would pay me to do chores around the house. And so he kind of taught me entrepreneurship at a fundamental level that if I did work and I provided value, then people would give me money. And when you're a kid and you want to buy stuff, then that's an attractive thought. And I kind of latched on to that. So I was always doing odd jobs here and there around the house and then around the neighborhood. I would mow lawns, collect cans and newspapers for recycling money. And as I grew up, I started little businesses here and there. I was a skater, skateboarder growing up, still am. And I nice. would... I contacted all these skateboard companies and I started selling skate stuff out of my car when I was in high school and created flyers and would drive around to spots and sell this stuff. And that gave me some training on marketing and 
just how to sell and how to provide value for people. And I sold candy bars at school. I just did all this odd stuff. But to me, entrepreneurship was something that you just kind of do that. Like people just start stuff. I didn't realize like this is how big businesses get started. I never thought about this. And I was just planning on being an artist when I went to school. That's all I knew how to do. I I thought, well, I know how to draw. So I guess I'm going to be an artist because that's all I know how to do. And I didn't like math. So I went to university in my first year. I did art school and absolutely loved it. But then I decided that I learned about business school and I decided, man, like this is what I really want to do. Like this entrepreneurship stuff. I didn't know you could study this. I didn't know. (laughs) I didn't know there was such a thing as a business school at a university. I was just so ignorant. Mm -hmm. And so when I found that out, I was like, oh man, like I love this stuff. I mean, this is what I've been doing is this entrepreneurship stuff. And this is what I really want to focus on. So I switched from art over to business. And then I had to go back and retake all those math classes I had failed because I didn't like it. <laughs> and then I found out I love math that once I was interested in it and had a reason to be interested in it. So then while I was in university, I got a job at a dot-com company back in 1999 And I was working for this company and I was watching the owners run around and meet with venture capitalists and hire people and build this business. And they were having all the fun. And I thought, man, like, it's not about the money. Like I was getting paid 13 bucks an hour US to be a web designer. And which is a lot back then. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, for me, I was like, I was like super happy. I was like, oh man, 13 bucks an hour. I mean, the minimum wage back then was like $5 an hour. So I was like, you know, this is great. I'm getting paid 13 bucks an hour, but, and it wasn't the money. It was just, I looked at what they were doing and I thought that looks so fun. And then the next thought was, why can't I do that? I mean, these guys aren't geniuses. I mean, they're smart guys, but it's not like they're geniuses. I can do this. Mm. And so I lasted about five months in that environment. And I was like, I can't take this anymore. I got to start something. This is driving me crazy. (laughs) So I, I quit that job right when they gave me, they came to me and they said, hey, we're issuing the first set of stock options in this company and we're going to give you 3,000 shares and we want you to quit school and come on full time. And I looked at this and I thought, oh, this is really tempting. And stock options were all the rage. I mean, this is 1999. Like, I can't communicate how big a deal it was to get stock options back then. It was like everybody was going crazy trying to get stock in the right companies and invest in the right companies and and so here I am, I'm working for this dot-com that's growing like crazy. They come to me, they say, What was say, the business, well, if you don't mind uh, sharing what, what kind so of... So at the time it was called mycomputer.com. It changed its name to Omniture. And then Omniture, the story here is they offered me these stock options. I turned it down. And then later they got bought out for $1.8 billion by Adobe. <laughs> and so... If I had stayed there and I had kept those stock options, I mean, I wouldn't have been like a millionaire necessarily, although if I had stayed, I could have worked up in the company, I could have gotten more stock options, so who knows. But but if I had just taken those options that they gave me at that time, it probably would have paid for like two houses or something. So, right. you know, I so there's some money I left on the table, but I just couldn't work for somebody else. I couldn't be inside that environment. It was just it was just killing me to look at what these guys were doing and think I could be doing that and then sit there and just work my job every day. Just not made that way. So I quit that job. I started doing web design freelance Mm. as my own little business. And then it just grew from there. Well, I shouldn't say it just grew. There were a lot of struggles there. But it would go up and it would go down and went up and down. But it turned into a real company with employees and a team and office and all this stuff and went through a lot of struggles. And I mean, long story short, that's the only job I've ever been able to keep more than five months. Everything else, I either quit because I got bored or I got fired from, again, because I got bored and then I didn't do such a good job. So this is the one job where it's always been exciting. It's always kept me engaged. And whether I was making money or not, I thought, man, this, this is so much fun. I'm so excited to get up and go to work every day. And you're talking about um, your own business right now, right? Yeah, M- MWI. It's it's the same business. I started this in 1999 when I started freelancing. And this is the same business I'm running to this day because every day it's still exciting. Right. Amazing. So how did you, when when that company exited for one point whatever billion, 
what that was that was several years later but how did you feel on that day that you found that out i mean there must have been at least a tinge of regret even though you know you knew that that wasn't the path for you you knew you had to do something on your own there's always you know the hindsight 2020 thing right i mean how did you feel that day yeah, I just had to laugh at it. It was just funny. It was just like, oh, man, well, now I've got a story at least about how I left uh, <laughs> all go. this money on the table. And But it was I, I had kept in touch with a bunch of my friends there, and I was friends with the founders. And I'd, I would talk to my friends who were still working there, and it's it was just like, I mean, some of them stayed for 10 years there, and I would look at that, and I was just like, man, I cannot imagine – if I had dedicated 10 years of my life to working for this other company, I just, that would have just driven me crazy. I can dedicate 10 years to my life to my own company, even mm. if I'm not getting paid, right. even if it's going terrible and still enjoy it. But I can't work for another company, even if I, it is going great. And it's just, when I work for somebody else that way, it turns into just a job mm -hmm. and I just can't dedicate my life to just a job, just to making money, just to supporting my family. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Like people do that. That's what my dad did. He got a job that was interesting, but for him, the purpose was, hey, I need to support my family. I need to make money. I want to find something that's interesting where I can do that. And that's what he did. Uh, for me, it just drives me crazy because there's something inside that makes me want look at everything and say, oh, there's this opportunity. I can turn this into this. I can grow this. I can create something here. And in a normal job, you're not allowed to do that very much. And so That's that right. would just drive me crazy. I just wouldn't be able to live in that kind of environment. Yeah. And, and, and to credit the generation before us, you know, I mean, that was a different era back then. You know, there weren't, I think we we're much more blessed and fortunate in, in our current era where, you know, the costs of you know, starting a business are as low as they've ever been. And there's actually more freedom because of the internet to do some of these things. But back then it was a survival uh, type thing. You know, my father was the same way, you know, first generation immigrant to U.S. And he just wanted to put food on the table. So there was no such thing as entrepreneurship. It was not, that word didn't exist in his vocabulary, right? Um, but there's an important lesson to learn here, Josh. And that's basically, you know, when you work for someone else, uh, I think there's, two types of people you know there's definitely the type of people that should not be entrepreneurs they should they thrive in an organization a larger you know machine uh, but then there are the, the the minority of people like yourself who you know no matter how much money it is if it's not your own if it's not your own thing then you just aren't happy working there so I think that's uh, it's pretty crucial to recognize that as early on as possible so you can start making the next steps. So let's talk about, well, thank you for sharing that, that story. It's a great story. Let's talk about how your company, MWI, transitioned over the years for you to now end up uh, living in Asia, um, Hong Kong a few years, and now you're in, actually in China. So I came to Hong Kong in June of 2013, and the motivation had nothing to do with business. Most people come to Asia because they have some sort of business reason to. But for me, I could work anywhere I wanted as long as I had an internet connection. And then my wife and I, we have two children. Our first child was adopted in the U.S. Our second child was biological. And our third, we felt drawn to adopt from China. And we felt like we needed to adopt an older child. And so as we were looking into this process and thinking about it, we thought, why don't we just move to China? Because if we're going to adopt an older child, then she'll come with the language barrier, she'll be used to her food, the culture, everything, and we don't know anything about this because we've never lived over there. So we thought if we can move to China, then we can understand our daughter better and we can ease that transition a bit. So, But we were scared to move to China and just up and go mm. come to China. So we moved to Hong Kong first as a first step. And then once I got to Hong Kong, we had to open an office of the business to keep a visa and stay in the country legally, had right. to do something. They don't just allow you to just move around and be there. So I we opened an office of MWI in Hong Kong, and then it took off, and it's going well, and we're up to about 10 people in that office. So once it oh, got nice. to that point and it was running itself, then we started saying, well, we should probably move somewhere else and open another office here in Asia while we're here. And we were looking at Singapore and we were looking at Taiwan and 
other places to go. And then a Wired magazine documentary came out on Shenzhen about six, seven months ago. And we watched this and it was all about Washambe and the startup scene in Shenzhen and everything that's going on. And as soon as that documentary ended, my wife looked at me and she's like, why would we move to Singapore? We should just be moving across the border to Shenzhen. I mean, look at what's going on over there. And I was like, yeah, like, let's go. Like, let's move to China. So we, within one month, we went from thinking about moving to Singapore and not really even having China on the map anymore to, all right, we moved and we went to China and we got an apartment. We were living in Shenzhen within one month, it just happened really, really fast. And wow. it's turned out to be an awesome decision. It's just, I mean, this is the center of everything that's going on. I mean, this is the Silicon Valley of China, but yeah. it's, it's really kind of the center of everything that's going on in the world right now. You've got the manufacturing, you've got hardware startups, you've got tech going on here. And when I go back to Silicon Valley and, I, I mean, Silicon Valley is awesome. It's, it's exciting, but I feel like there's more going on here in Shenzhen in that this is more grassroots. And this is, I mean, Silicon Valley was the last 10, 20 years. I feel like what's going on here in Shenzhen is the next 10, 20 years. Oh, absolutely. And and just for the record, that that Wired uh, magazine documentary is, was really well done. I mean, I think it was the best. It definitely was uh, everything that I've seen, any sort of documentary that I've seen thus far on China was has not really, I don't know, it, it hasn't been as good as that one. And that one really sort of, it was definitely geared towards tech and, and whatnot, but uh, it really it really showed the vibrance of the city. So that's pretty fascinating. So Josh, let's talk about MWI, your company specifically. So this is a company that you've uh, built over the last almost 20 years now. And from what started as, uh, I guess, a web design company, now you are basically a full-scale digital marketing agency. Tell us a little bit about MWI. What exactly does your firm do? Who are your typical types of clients? And what, what do you exactly help your clients achieve? Sure. So MWI, yeah, it's a full-service digital marketing agency, like you said. So we do websites, SEO, paid search, social media management, content marketing, uh, we do digital PR, so we get clients into publications like Forbes, Mashable, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur, Inc. And the basic mission behind MWI is we want to help great companies grow. So we're selective about the companies we work with. And when a company comes along, we look at their product, their offering, and we say, is this making a difference in the world? Is this really contributing something? Or is it just fluff? And if we feel like it's a great company that has great potential and is doing something good, then we take them on as a client and then we provide all these services to help them grow. And that's how we feel fulfilled and feel like we're making a difference in the world is by working with these great companies. And so we have a team of about 25 people and that's split between the US and Hong Kong and now we're building things up here in China. And Clients come to us, they say, we need to sell more stuff, essentially, and we, we help them sell stuff. We help them grow by increasing revenue, either they're selling products or services, and we sit down with them and create strategies and customized plans to say, okay, here is the best mix of services for your business to grow as quickly as possible with the least expense possible, and that's what we do. So what what are some of the typical, let, let's talk about specifically in Asia and maybe maybe even Hong Kong. Let's go really home, home turf here. So let's say, what are some of the typical types of business? Are they brick and mortar type businesses that come to you or are they larger sort of maybe Fortune 500 type companies that are just behind in the digital marketing game that come to you that that need help? Sure, I'll give you three examples to kind of show the spectrum of clients we work with and some of the ex some examples of what we do. So at the high end, uh, two of our clients are Manulife and Standard Life. And these are huge insurance companies. They're multinational, they're global, they're billion dollar businesses, they're huge. Mm. Uh, so with Standard Life, we worked on a content marketing campaign with them where we wrote about 45 blog posts for them for their executives. So we write the blog posts and then they push these blog posts out, um, we're essentially ghost writing for their executives. Mm -hmm. And so that was a content marketing campaign that we ran for them. For Manulife, we developed a bunch of infographics. So these big, long vertical graphics that get a certain point across. 
we developed some of those for Manual Life, and then they pump those out through their social media channels, websites. Uh, their sales associates use these on iPads for explaining things to customers. So that was a program we did for them. Mm-hmm. On the other side of things, on the startup side, we had a young woman came to us in Hong Kong and she said, hey, I've got a lot of contacts in the jewelry business and I sell stuff to my friends and I want to, I've got the funding and the backing to go out and create an online e-commerce jewelry store. And this is already out there. I mean, there are all sorts of huge competitors in this space, but she had a certain niche and we have experience building e-commerce websites and marketing those websites. So we built this awesome e-commerce jewelry website for her Mm -hmm. and just launched that recently and now she's starting to grow and starting to build her business selling her jewelry online and so she's a small startup it's basically her and her husband and then she's hoping to grow this into a larger business and then in between we've got companies like mini box self-storage so this is a self-storage company based in hong kong they have a few facilities there And this is one of those places where you take your stuff that you can't fit in your flat and you put it in boxes and then you take it over to mini box and they put it in a room and you leave it there for two years until you need it or you're moving or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so mini box, it came to us and said, Hey, our problem is we've got, we're at 70 or 80% capacity and we want to be at 95% capacity at all our facilities. So they came to us and we work on their local map listings on Google. We work on SEO. We manage their paid search. We do some social media management for them. And over the past few years, we've taken them from whatever the availability was or occupancy rate was at the time. I don't remember exactly. But now we've taken them to where two months ago they came and they said, hey, we're actually totally full. So then they scaled back on their services, which is like, we're like, hey, wait a second, we just did a great job and now you're scaling back. But <laughs> but now they're going to build more facilities because they're full, so they're going to expand and then they're going to expand their services with us. So it'll it'll work out in the long run. But those are three examples of kind of the big end, the enterprise, the startup, and then kind of the medium-sized business in the middle and some of the things that we do for them. That's pretty exciting. I think that I think there's a little bit of education, I think, for especially on, well, actually for both sides, you know, I think in, in, in the U.S., I think that a lot of the larger companies are really getting on the bandwagon now, and which is good to see. But I think over in Asia, there's there's still a lot of growth there and even large co- companies like, you know, the likes of Manulife and stuff. A lot of them are not that active on di- in digital yet and or maybe very arm's length. And even if they are, it's some guy that's maybe sitting uh, an intern or someone that that has <laughs> has some experience on Facebook that's just kind of putting stuff out but doesn't really have much direction so i think that there's a lot of opportunity for you here uh, in asia and and what about specifically in china now that you're based in shenzhen are there companies that you consult there as well yeah i want to touch on this though going back to you know this challenge with big companies the challenge that they face i was a little backstory here. So mm-hmm. uh, in January, I had the chance to go to Necker Island in the Caribbean. That's Richard Branson's island. Oh, and wow, I hung nice. out with a bunch of marketers for a week. And it was this incredible experience. Amazing. And the head of the largest PR firm in the world was there. And they do a lot of PR and advertising. So their clients give them money and they have to go spend this money on advertising and marketing and figure out where do we put this money. And he made this comment that a lot of people kind of rolled their eyes at, like, oh, yeah, you've got problems. And his comment was, it's really hard to spend $14 billion a year. That's how much money his clients give him to spend on marketing. And he's complaining about this. Like, do you know how hard it is to spend $14 billion a year? And we're like, yeah, that's that's a, that's a terrible problem you've got there. Yeah. But it really is a problem because this guy, somebody gives him $100 million and says, spend this in one year. He's got to spend that money or else they're not going to come back and give Mm. it to him next year. Mm -hmm. And when he's spending that much money for a client, he's got to find stuff that he can spend. I mean, this is why people buy Super Bowl ads for $4 million or whatever they cost is because they can reach a lot of people Mm -hmm. really quickly and they can get rid of some of that money that way. But when you're a big company and you're looking at what's happening with Facebook and with SEO and with all these different niches that people are targeting, you say, wait a second, I don't have the time 
to go spend money on these things because it's too small. I can't target all these niches. If I tried to spend $100 million across all these niches, I just it takes too much time. I don't have time to focus mm -hmm. on 10,000 different niches. And so all these startups come in, and of course a startup comes in and they say, well, I'm going to focus on just one niche. And for a big company like this, they're saying, it's not worth it for me to go spend $5,000 a month focusing on this niche. I need to spend... $20,000 a month or $50,000 a month. And it's just too granular. It's too detailed for these large companies. So this guy was talking about how this is a real challenge for the big ad agencies because as advertising and marketing opportunities fragment into these smaller niches and these smaller channels, they're struggling because they're, they grew up in a world where they could go spend millions of dollars on radio and TV and print ads and magazines that went far and wide. But we're seeing that these large publications or these large channels like TV channels, radio, magazines, they're being broken up. And what's replacing them are blogs mm -hmm. and social media channels like some guy's social media page. That's what's replacing these huge publications. And they're all smaller. And so these big advertisers are scrambling trying to figure out how do we get our money into these places efficiently in a way that we can actually manage it. And it is a real challenge. But that's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs. This is how entrepreneurs can compete against the big guys. Mm -hmm. It's also a great opportunity for some entrepreneur to say, hey, I can build technology or processes or systems to target all these niches, and then I can go sell that to these large corporations. There's some amazing opportunities to do arbitrage in the middle of that. So anyway, just an opportunity for some scrappy entrepreneur out there. <laughs> no, that's really interesting, and I think the I think a parallel that I can draw, being I, I'm from the fin I'm financial background, and I'm an investor now, and I worked in as a broker for many years as well. Um, but one of the parallels that, that I can draw is kind of like when you have a, this large fund manager, like a long only fund manager who has X amount of, of cash that he has to invest in the market. And that's part of the mandate of the fund. And they're just trying to find stocks that have a good ROI that they can show their investors. Um, but they have deadlines. So like every end of every quarter, you always see huge movements in a lot of these uh, names that the the long onlys like to buy and sell and it's just that it's it's very similar like these large i'm sure that it's like the same sort of challenge it's like where can i put my money but have a very decent roi that i can go back to my clients and, and show them the results right yeah i mean that's the thing with these startups a lot of startups they're like man i just need a million dollars i just need two million dollars and i could do so much with it why can't i get this big money from these huge institutional investors or something well the problem is that you're only asking for one or two million dollars and you can't justify asking for 20 million or something when you're starting up and these guys are looking for an investment where they can plunk down 200 million or something you're just you're mm -hmm. too small of an investment right. they need bigger investments and yeah awesome so let's talk about your website your you have a personal website uh, joshsteinley.com which has a very evocative sort of tagline when you go on it. The landing page says, I turn people into influencers. And I think this is great because right now in the, in the world that we live in and in, of infinite noise uh, and the, the, just the, the overload of content that's out there, people are trying to get their voices heard. So tell us a little bit about how, you know, how, do, how does one become an influencer? What has your, your experience been with that? Um, I know you're, you know, you are a very well published uh, writer, author, um, been published in multiple top name uh, publications, Forbes, Mashable, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur Magazine, the likes of it, uh, hundreds of articles, uh, you know, that has obviously been very good for your personal uh, influence and career. So tell us a little bit about how someone would become an influencer and what, what are the right steps for someone listening that, that, that they could take? There are different stories for everybody who becomes an influencer, but my story is I always loved writing. I had a blog since gee, 2002, 2003 or something. I think I started blogging and I wrote because I loved writing. Whether anybody read it or not, I didn't even care. If mm. people read it, it was just oh, yeah, that's great. Like, I love writing and people love reading this and they're getting value from it. Like, that was just extra bonus for me. But really, I just loved writing for mm -hmm. myself. 
And so I wrote for 10 years. I probably wrote over a thousand blog posts and it didn't get a lot of attention. I mean, I'd get a couple hundred readers a month, but you know, not, nothing huge like some people get where they're getting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. It wasn't like that. So I just had my small blog and I'm going along writing and having a good old time. And then I had a friend who's this public relations guru and she wrote for Forbes magazine. And I went to her, this is about four years ago, and I was asking her how to grow my business and how to use PR. And I wanted to get those badges on my website where it says, as seen in all Mm -hmm. these big Mm -hmm. publications, because I felt like that would add credibility for my company and help me sell more of what I do. So I went to her and I was asking her about this PR thing. And then I said, oh, hey, Cheryl, how did you get on Forbes? Like, that seems pretty cool that you write for them. Like, how does that work? Do you Mm -hmm. get paid for that or what? And she said, no, they have this contributor thing where they'll sign you up as a contributor. You're not a real journalist. You're not a real Forbes writer, but you get to contribute articles and they don't pay you. But you get to have your content on Forbes and there's a lot of value in that. And I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And she said, hey, I can, my editor's coming to town in two weeks. I can make an introduction. And I thought, the first thought I had was, well, gee, I'm really busy running my business. I mean, I don't know if I really have time. I mean, this sounds like an amazing opportunity, right, for Forbes. But, I mean, I'm, I'm busy. I've got to run my business. Right. And I almost turned it down. But thankfully, I kept my mouth shut. And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. And so two weeks later, she introduced me to her editor, and she had already sent him my blog. And he said, hey, I looked at your blog, love what you're writing. We want you to write the exact same thing, except it's going to be on Forbes. Nice. And I said, great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. And I started writing for Forbes. And at first, I just wrote about entrepreneurship and startups. I really didn't want to do anything that could be misconstrued as self-promotional. Mm-hmm. So I didn't talk about digital marketing, but after a few months, I noticed, well, everybody else is talking about digital marketing and they run digital marketing agencies. So why can't I talk about digital marketing? So I started writing posts on Forbes about digital marketing, about SEO and about other marketing. And as soon as I did that, we started getting tons of people calling us because people would find one of my articles which answered a question they had about digital marketing. And often these people were looking to hire a digital marketing agency. So they would look at my profile then and figure out who I was and see, oh, he runs an agency. Well, he's on Forbes, so he must know what he's talking about. And the article sounds reasonable. And why don't we just go hire this guy to do this for us? Amazing. So then they would call my agency. And the agent that's when our agency just took off. It just exploded because we were getting tons of leads in. And whereas before, we were going out and contacting companies and saying, hey, you should hire us. We've got all this experience. We're really good. We do this. And then people are like, well, yeah, you say that, but how do I know I can really trust you? Now, people were finding us through Forbes. And so that trust barrier was just gone because we were on Forbes. So they would come to us and say, hey, you're on Forbes. I know I can trust you. I'm ready to go. That's awesome. And so all these questions that normally come up in the sales cycle just disappeared because we were on Forbes and we just started closing business left and right and things started growing like crazy. So that opened so many doors for me to be writing on Forbes. It opened doors for me to write for all these other publications. I got a book deal out of it. I started getting paid to speak at events and it just grew and my personal brand grew as a result of this. And my agency grew. And then I'm looking back. I'm like, man, thank goodness I did not turn this away. Yeah, I'm too busy. Like, (laughs) come on. Like, I mean, that would have been really leaving money on the table. Uh, So that's such a great story. That's such a great story, Josh. And, And it also it also proves that. There, you know, these people that say, oh, you, you got lucky or overnight millionaire or whatever, um, you know, you've been writing for a decade, like you said, a thousand blog posts. And if you hadn't had that, you know, backing, you know, that you'd, you'd put in the work, if you hadn't done that, then the guy would have been like, OK, well, it's a nice introduction, but I don't see anything on his blog, really, you know, and uh, who is this guy? And so, no, I'm in a pass. Right. So. Um, that was very serendipitous, but it, it was also because you had done the hard work ahead of time. Right. I mean, it's a 10-year overnight success story, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, so then an interesting thing just happened in the last six months, which is for the past four years, three, four years, I've been writing all this content. I've been pushing out a lot of content, and I've built my personal brand by creating my own content. 
But within the last six months, really since my book came out, something flipped, which is now people are coming to me and they're asking for my opinion and I'm getting into articles without having to create the content anymore. Other people are creating content about me Mm. rather than me creating content based on my own thoughts. And so now it's just feeding itself where my personal brand has created this cycle of its own that feeds itself. And so now it's just this really interesting phase where I don't have to work that hard because I've put in this investment over the past three years. And a few months ago, I was listening to a podcast by Neil Patel. He's a big Mm -hmm. marketing influencer. And he said, somebody asked him the question, how long does it take to become an influencer? And he said, three years. And I looked at my own experience. I was like, that's exactly my scenario. It took me three years to go from the point of where I started writing content to where I feel like I've really arrived and become, I've built up a personal brand that is self-sustaining, that I don't have to push, push, push and create it myself, but now it's feeding itself and it's really taking off. So I look at what I've done over the past three years. I've done a lot of work over the past three years. I'm still going to keep doing a lot of work and I'm still creating content, but now it's gotten to the point where it feeds itself and it grows on its own. It's kind of like launching a business and finally you see that, oh wow, this is actually running itself. It's actually feeding itself. It's self-sustaining. That's an exciting point as an entrepreneur. That's the point I've reached as a influencer, a thought leader. It's weird to call yourself that, but anyway, it's 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 uh, this great point of self-sustaining success where I'm like, now it's exciting to think of what I can do with that and how I can use that and grow that into something that helps even more people. That's amazing. That's such a cool story. And I think that, uh, you know, it's it's really cool that you're on the other end now of, of the hard work and you're starting to see some of that leverage pay off and the flywheel is spinning, which is really cool. Um, and, and to be fair, in the grand scheme of things, three years is actually not that long of a time. I and mean, if you really think about it, I think people are very sort of, uh, they fantasize about the overnight thing or going viral, a post going viral and they're making it Uh, overnight. But in reality, you know, three years of hard work for millions of dollars and and, and a decade or decades of business uh, coming forward is is very small, uh, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So I think that's great. Um, Josh, thank you so much for your time today. We have to look to wrap up. Just a final couple final questions for you. Um, What's one piece of advice that you would give uh, some of maybe some of the young aspiring entrepreneurs that are listening to this podcast today? Going to this point of, you know, three years is not a long time. That's one thing I see with a lot of young entrepreneurs is they want the overnight success, right? And on the one hand, you are short on time. Time goes by really fast. On the other hand, you've got time. And what I see is that a lot of people think, I want things to happen in three months. I want things to happen in six months, when in reality, it's going to take two or three years. And then what happens is because they're going after the short term and they're going for the quick gain, They never achieve the success. And then three years down the road, they're looking back and they're thinking, man, if I hadn't been going after all these one hits and thinking short term, Mm. where could I be today? So on the one hand, you've got to look at the long term and think, you know, I've got time. I've got time to do this the right way. There's no rush. I can take my time, do it right. On the other hand, You don't want to get lazy and think, oh, I've got 10 years, I've got 20 years, because that's going to go by really fast. And if you get lazy, then you get caught behind as well. Mm. Sound advice, Josh. And uh, last question is, where can people find you, follow you, and connect with you if they want to uh, reach out and learn more about you? So my agency is MWI.com. My personal website is JoshStimely.com, which is J-O-S-H-S-T-E-I-M-L-E. Nobody can spell that right, so I've got to spell it out. (laughs) And uh, I'm also on Twitter and everywhere else, but go to my website and all the links are there. Yes. And also, if you Google search Josh S-T-E-I, then you're like the top 10 hits. So Forbes. Yeah, it's not a common name. So it's pretty I'm pretty easy to find (laughs) once you get the first few letters right. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Josh. I really appreciate it. And uh, we, we had a great time talking to you today. Thank you so much, Jay. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show.
I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.